we've come together today and we, we've come to worship the Lord and we, we've looked at that just a little bit in the past of, in, in how we are <coughs> to behave, how we're to act, how we're to respond to what God has done for us. And in doing so, what can we bring to God? Ourselves. Praises. Praises. Repentance. What's that? Repentance. Repentance. Saying, God, I'm not doing it your way, but I want to. You know, there's, you know, the, the, I think that's something that, you know, especially the society we live in, it's always about, you know, what God can do for me. You know, I want to be rich. I want to be, you know, successful, all these things. But, you know, have you ever <coughs> stopped and thought, you know, what is it I need to bring to God? You know, well, you know, you know, you might think, well, here we go. This is going to be a, a message on tithing. No, it's not. You know, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills too. And that's something that you need to resolve between you and God. You know, he says, "Try me on this," and he'll, he can, he can out shovel you. Trust me. You know, you, you got a shovel, he's got a bigger one. But what you know. I, I was thinking about this, you know, and because and I thought I was kind of done with Romans. You know, the last you know, couple of chapters is, you know, is, is kind of the, 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 you know, Paul signing off, you know, greet everybody and this type of thing. And, and, and God took me back to Romans chapter 15. And we were going to find ourselves at verse 14. But as you're turning there, you know, it, it brought to mind... You know, the things of what does God want from us? And what does he find acceptable? Well, one, one idea can be found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. I'll just read it to you. And it says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, thinking about the Old Testament, sacrifices in the Old Testament were what? Dead. Yeah, it, it, it was something that you had to, to give up, right? Drink offerings and burnt offerings and all those things. But basically, you know, the, the sacrifice died. It had to shed blood, you know, for the forgiveness of sins. Well, Christ has shed his blood for us, and we have the forgiveness of sins already as Christians. But now, we, we, we still, I mean, like I said, we come together to worship him, you know, and, and, and bringing, you know, things to him. And, and here the example is, is to follow Christ's example. You know, Christ lived a life of love. And in this passage here, and that, that was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He lived his life as that sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know, it's to live for him is how we can offer a, a sacrifice to him. That's one of the things that you and I can do. You know, we don't just come to church and, and sing a song and that impresses God. You know, it, it's the praise and, the, and the, the worship that comes from our hearts. And then, then he looks at us and say, are you really living your life to please me? You know, are we living sacrifices? You know, uh, you know, it, sh it shouldn't just end on Sundays. You know, it, it should be something that we do continually. And that's kind of what, you know, we find ourselves today. We've, we've made it all the way up to Romans chapter 15, verse 14. That's where we're going to start out. And it says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Complete in knowledge, incompetent to instruct one another. Are you all full of goodness? Well, who's good? God is good, right? You know, we, we have him inside of us. He, he lives in our hearts. 
You know, and, and, and that's, you know, I think where this comes from. Because I know there's nothing good that dwells in me by my own nature. You know, I, I've seen how I react when somebody does something to me in traffic. And, and it's not goodness that comes out. And I have to repent for that. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm hope I'm not the only one here that's raising his hand saying, yeah, I, I struggle with goodness. But Paul's saying, no, I, I'm convinced that you are full of goodness. You know, do, do we live our lives for him? Do we allow him to live his life through us? And con uh, complete in knowledge. You know, he, he, you know, Paul has been dealing with the, the church in Rome. And, he, and he's saying, I've, I've gone through all these things. All, all the things that, you know, you should believe as Christians. You know, and, and to sum it all up, I, I, I would say the first 11 chapters in Romans, it's all about Christ. You know, and in him are hidden all the, the, the wisdom and knowledge of God. So if you have Christ in your life, then you have knowledge inside you. And, and, and we should be teaching each other. You know, our experiences in life, you know, what God has revealed to us through his word and through, through our situations in life. You know, God is good. Amen. And you know, that's how Paul starts this right here. He says he's convinced of this. You know, he probably not met most of the people that were in this church. He's going by what he's heard about their faith, but he's also knowing his God, our God, and what he does in, in the believers' lives. Verse 15 says, I have written you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave to me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. You know what? We have that same duty as believers to, to, to go and to make disciples and to share the gospel of God. We're all competent in that because of God and his word. And, and, and he says here, I'm reminding you of those things that, that I have taught you. You know, I don't know about you, but I need a reminder every now and then, or more like continually. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, we just, we're about done through Romans, and, 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 and I'm going to go back and you know, reread Romans over and over again, because there are so many things there to, to remind me of what God's done for me. You know, the wages of sin is death. I, that's what I deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life. You know, those reminders that it's all about Jesus. It's in him that we have been justified. We've been given the you know, righteousness in the eyes of God. We've been redeemed back from the ways of sin. Those are good reminders. And Paul's saying, yeah, I, I, I wrote this to remind you of those things. See, they didn't have the Bible back then. They had the letters, and you know, the letters were being passed around, and they were being copied and distributed. And, and it wasn't until later that the Bible was fully assembled, the Bible that we have nowadays. But it's still good to remind each other, get into the Word. You know, be reminded of the things that God has promised us. All right? And it continues on, proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You know, do you realize that, that we have been accepted by God as a gift back to him, through him from his son? His redeeming work on the cross, the, the, the payment of sins, that has, that has been made, we, you know, the redemption that, that, uh, that occurred. And now we're a gift back to him. But notice it says that it, we've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That, that's one of those terms that we need to understand. We've been sanctified. What does that mean? Well, it means to be set apart as holy. You know, to, to be dedicated to God. As a gift. You know, we, were, we basically were bought out of, uh, out of sin and, and, and all our righteousness was filthy rags and Christ came along and said, I've paid your sin debt in full and now here's my robe of righteousness that you may put on. And you get to stand before the Father in right standing. You now have peace with God. 
And it's, we were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You know, for a lot of years, you know, uh, you know, using the word of the, you know, the language of the King James, it was, it was the Holy Ghost. And that was something that I didn't understand. You know, I always was confused about, you know, you know a ghost, that sounded, you know, frightening. But no, it's God's Spirit indwelling the believers. And how does this happen? Well, we found out in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Just let me read you that passage here. This is John the Baptist speaking. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winning fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat, or, uh, his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's God. It's Jesus. And he is giving us the Holy Spirit. And, and another passage in, in the Gospel of Luke, basically it was talking about, you know, giving good gifts. Well, our Father in Heaven knows how to give good gifts. And He says, He'll give us the Holy Spirit if we just ask. That's why, that's why I think it's important. You know, we get refreshed and we renewed each time we come together. You know, uh, you know. You go through certain things in life and you get drained out. You know, you, you, it's like you're all out of energy. You're, you're, you feel just, def, you know, I won't say defeated, but you feel just drained. And, and God comes along and says, let me fill you back up again. Re revive you once again. And that's what I think the church needs more of is, is revival. And that's the presence of God's power in our lives and in our churches. But here in, in this uh, passage, you know, we, we've been given as a gift and we've been sanctified. We've been dedicated to the Lord by the Holy Spirit. You know, now knowing this, that, 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 we're, that we're an offering acceptable to God. That word acceptable, it's well received or accepted or acceptable is, is the Greek word. You know, beforehand we were covered in, 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 in sin. And, and, and we were dead. But through the work of Jesus Christ, we are now acceptable to God. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. It's his gift to us and to his Father. Well, let's look at this idea just a little bit more. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56, we're going to read verses 1 through uh, 7 here. And, and the, the header in this Bible says, Salvation for Others. Talking about us Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And it says there, this is what the Lord says. You know, you ever remember those uh, commercials when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen? Yeah. I think when the Lord talks, we should really be listening. And it says here, this is what the Lord says, so we should really pay attention. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will be revealed, or soon be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. This passage starts out with maintain justice. Is that going on in the world around us? No. So is it okay for us not to? No, we're called to maintain justice. And it goes on to say, and do what is right. Why? The Lord is watching. Mm -hmm. He knows. He sees. And it says, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. This was Isaiah talking to the nation of Israel. We know God's righteousness. His name is Jesus. And it goes on to say that blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. You know, sometimes, I, you know, I don't know about you, but you read about the Sabbath day and, and how, you know, that was observed on a Saturday, that Saturday was the Sabbath day. But, you know, it, it really wasn't about the day. 
If you, if you turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, I'll read it to you if you want, but this is the Lord giving us the Ten Commandments as he spoke from Mount Sinai. And it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your mad, uh, manservant or your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the aliens within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. God has given us a earthly picture of heavenly things. You know, for the nation of Israel, they had to work six days. They, you know, they, they didn't have the kind of society we do where, hey, I'm going to take a vacation or I'm going to go off and goof off for a month and then come back. If you, if you goofed off for a couple weeks, you didn't have anything to eat. You know, but this idea of the Sabbath day, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a picture of heavenly things. The, the work that they had to do to, 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 to live, to survive. Well, in a spiritual realm, we have been given new life, but it's not by our works. What is it by? Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, by Christ, right. Well, that, that kind of goes on to, you know, in Colossians. Again, let me read you this passage. Sorry to jump all around, but I just, the Lord you know, impressed this upon my heart to... To bring this up, and this is Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. They are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Jesus Christ is our rest mm -hmm. from our labors. We no longer have to try and work our way to salvation, to, to, to be in God's presence, to, to, to righteousness. He is our righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 4, it, it talks about these things. There remains a, a Sabbath rest for his people who believe. In Jesus. It's not about observing the day. It's about understanding that God has provided rest for his people. And he says basically there in, in back in Exodus is that we're, we're to remember the Sabbath day and to not profane it, not to, to, to degrade it, not to, to tear it down. But that is because we are not to add anything to Christ or to take anything away from that. It was, a, uh, it was an earthly picture of heavenly things. Christ Jesus is our rest. And in him, we can observe the Sabbath, that rest that God promised his people. Turning back to Isaiah chapter 56, It says, blessed is the man who does this, who, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and holds fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love his name, or to love the name of the Lord and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. 
He's talking there to us, to the foreigners. Have you bound yourself to the Lord to serve him? Does he deserve that from us? He does, doesn't he? We, we are his servants. He, we've been bought at a price. We were slaves to sin. Now we're slaves to righteousness. And that righteousness can only be found in God and God alone. We are to serve him in righteousness. So we've bound ourselves to him, to serve him, to love the name of the Lord. Do you love his name? Do you love what he done through his son, Jesus? He gave Jesus the name that is above all names. That at his name, all, all knees will bow and all tongue, tongues confess that he is Lord. Mm-hmm. And to worship him. You know, we come together to, you know, and we worship him, but that's, you know, that's just a small clip of what we should be doing. You know, back in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you know, we're to be living sacrifices. That's how we really, truly worship him. We worship him in spirit and in truth. We, we follow the example of Christ that he laid out for us. He loved. These are all sacrifices and offerings that God is pleased with. Again, earthly things, the temple worship, they offered incense. They offered burnt offerings and, and sacrifices. The blood was spilled for the forgiveness of sins, to cover over their sins. And, and we already have that through Christ Jesus. So now we can offer him the, the praises and prayers of, of the saints, which in the book of Revelation is pictured as incense going up before the, the Lord. Do you realize that your prayers are incense? They're pleasing to God. It goes on there in, Revel- or in Isaiah chapter 56 at verse 7. It says, their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You want to please God? You want to offer something back to him? We can pray. And and it's not the prayers that the world is so full of today. Lord, just make me successful. Lord, I just want the money. Lord, I just need the bigger house. Lord, I need this. I need that. I want, 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 want. Anybody ever found yourself doing that? Yeah, it's the human condition, isn't it? But in Psalms, we're told to enter his presence with thanksgiving and praise. Has God already blessed you in your lives? Thank him for it. Praise him for the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross. That, that, That was his plan before mankind ever came onto the scene. He gave us a choice. You know, you you think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They didn't know what sin was up to that point. You know, when when, when they walked with God, they did have fellowship, but did they truly love God? You know, for, for him who's been forgiven much, you know, we can love much, can't we? God gave us the opportunity to choose eternity with him, or separation from him. God never forced us into fellowship with him. Never, he never forced us to worship him. Think about Nebuchadnezzar and his statue of gold. And, and you know, when they, they were to hear all the musical instruments and the trumpet and the lyre and the zoot and all, yeah, all those different instruments, I can never remember all their names. And he said, what, what, what would happen when you heard that? Is you'd fall down and worship the image. Well, first of all, was that true worship? No, that was just bending a knee out of obedience, right? My my will is yielded to you. But but that wasn't true worship. We can choose to worship God. We can give him our love and our adoration and our praise and our thanks. We can offer up prayers to him. Remember Daniel? 
you know, basically, again, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, made the edict that nobody can pray for the next 30 days other than to him. He's not God. He couldn't hear prayers. We can offer our prayers to God and he hears us. We can lift people up to the altar of God and place them there. You know, those that are, that are lost or dying or sick, Lord, I, I want you to move on, on, on our behalf because these are our desires, Lord. And it's all for his glory. You want to see your prayers answered. Make them for the glory of God and not for the glory of us. You know, Lord, let them know that we are worshipers of the true and living God. Lord, let them see your son and their need of a savior. Those are the things that we can bring to God. Those are the things that are acceptable to God. You know, yeah, we can bring gold and, and silver, money, to, to do God's work, but that, that's not what impresses him. You know, you know, we joke about those people that try and take their gold to heaven. They get there to the, the gates of heaven and, and uh, they look at them and go, you know, why have you brought all that paving material up here with you? We already got plenty. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. That's the invitation that we have. We can go before the sovereign of the universe and tell him our cares. We can offer our praises to him. We can offer our thanksgiving to him for what he's done. Thinking about this same idea, we've got one more passage. If you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, we'll start out at verse 15. And the first two words there in chapter, uh, or verse 15 says, it says, through Jesus. Do you realize that everything we have is because of Jesus? Our access to God, the Father, is through Jesus. It's because of everything he has done. Well, it starts out here and it says, through Jesus, therefore... Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. The, fruits of lip, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do you praise God? Do you thank him? You know, that's one of the few things that we can offer up that's, uh, that, that we have, that we own, is our praise. Mm -hmm. You know? He just wants us to acknowledge what he's done in our lives. All glory and honor belong to him. You know, about the time you think you're doing, doing something you know, impressive, you're, and you, you know, say something like, I will do this, or, you know, I've done this, you know? Like Nebuchadnezzar again, we could, we're picking on Nebuchadnezzar today, you know. And he was walking along his you know, palace walls and he says, look at what my hand has done. And he'd already been warned, you know. And then from that time on, he was, he was basically forced to, to go out and graze like one of the animals until he lifted his eyes towards heaven and acknowledged God and what he had done. Yeah. There's a warning there for us too. All praise belongs to God. He gives us the strength to do things. I remember when we were building onto this building here, it was, it, we always were sure to make sure it, we honored God for what he was doing because God was the one doing it. There was a couple times when we didn't know where the money was going to come from to finish the job. Mm -hmm. And God would provide. Yes, he did. The letter had come in the mail. It was addressed to just my dad at Moore, Idaho. And there would be $100 bills inside that envelope mm -hmm. to buy the material we needed. It was God's mighty hand at work. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do it. Lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, 
God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for they would be of no or for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be uh, so uh, pray so that I may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back, G or, or brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice that request from Paul, his prayer, is for doing God's will. And that he works in us for what pleases him. You know, we, we say that we are servants of the Most High. A servant lived to, to serve his master, his owner. We live to serve God. You know, we've seen in, in the book of Romans of, of what we need to believe, but then also how do we need to act towards our fellow man and the, towards authorities and towards the, the things of life. But we're also here, we, we need to know how we're to, to respond to God and what he's done for us. We're his. We've been bought with a price. But he set us free. He set us free from what we were slaves to. So we could serve him out of love. To him be glory forever and ever. So, what does God want from us? Acknowledgement of who he is and what he's done. He doesn't share his glory with any man. We give him the honor and the glory for what he does. And you want to see your, your life blessed? You want to see your prayers answered? Glorify him in what he does. Everything is, uh, is for the glory of God. Not for the glory of the church. Not for the glory of us. But for him. Then you'll see God at work in your life. In a very powerful way. Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. You know, when you come together in a worship service, I hope you truly are worshiping God in a way that comes from your heart for all the things that God has done for you, for salvation, for eternal life, for the blessings and the promises that we have in his word. Spend a little time thanking him. You know, when you, when you start thanking God for everything that he's already given you, you'll realize how much you are truly blessed. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, thank you for sharing with us your, your glory, Lord, with, you, with your blessings, for sharing with us your Son, for giving him to us as a, as a redeeming sacrifice, Lord. Lord, setting us free from the law, the written law, the, the law of sin and death, the, the, but bringing us into the law of love, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to, to love like you have loved us, Lord, to, to love our, our neighbors and to love our enemies, but, Lord, also to, to, to love you back the way that you deserve, Lord. To love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to just see the, the blessings that we have through, through your Son, Lord, and that we will share that good news of Jesus with a lost and dying world, Lord. Lord, as the prayer has gone out, Lord, give us opportunities once again to share your love with those around us, Lord, for, for they are all our neighbors, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Lord, and we ask now that you'll just move upon our hearts and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.